7 million units purchased worldwide and the world's largest software base for education and entertainment. With this superb Australian reference book included, all for $399 at Commodore Dealers. Now, I am giving up with the Commodore. So, in the mid 80s, yeah, I know it's clap worthy, isn't it? Uh, Australian advertising for the Commodore asked, Are you keeping up with the Commodore because the Commodore is keeping up with you? Um, besides sort of a vague, a creepy tone, what exactly is being communicated in this tagline? Uh, well, as my mock loading screen earlier suggested, I, I think the idea of losing a race of any kind to the Commodore seems more insulting than enticing. Um, or perhaps it is a tacit suggestion that the Commodore really can't keep up, but I think we need to shift our own expectations just a bit. Uh, so here in a slightly different key is part of the uh, vision that Commodore is peddling. A day in the life of a Commodore 64. So the middle class suburban household wakens to a Commodore 64, which helps the family in work, finance, school, and play, and all appropriately set to box Invention 13 in A minor. Uh, keeping up with the Commodore is not about upgrading one's computer specs, although that was somewhat part of the message then, but it's really about upgrading one's lifestyle by shifting what we might call analog activity onto a digital platform. Computation as such was the innovation, and it didn't look or feel uh, like the computing we know today. In fact, the disconnect feels much larger than 30 years would suggest. Why? Well, certainly there was rapid technological change, but the sh shift in machine specs only begins to tell the tale. An entire cultural field informs the experience of early microcomputing, and that experience we are arguing today is perhaps more ephemeral than the physical hardware or the disembodied software contents alone, I might suggest. Um, now, scholars are engaging this cultural field in interesting ways. Notably, MIT is publishing two major series on platform studies and on software studies um, uh, that shed light on topics ranging from the intricacies of the Atari VCS to the implications of a single line of code on the Commodore 64. Our approach is something of a middle focus lens between this close up look at platform and software and the long sort of long timeline view of computer histories. While our data set, as it were, is the Commodore, uh, the platform serves as stand in for a broad range of computational encounters in what I like to think of as the long 1980s. Um, so, that help us analyze the experiential aspects of early on computing. We borrowed two concepts from literary and textual criticism, chronotope and paratext, um, one of which appears in our title. Now, these are fancy terms with elaborate theory behind them, but at the root, chronotope is simply an amalgamation of the Greek roots for uh, time and place, while paratext describes those textual elements that surrounds content proper. Uh, in Dialogic Imagination, Russian literary critic Mikhail Bakhtin argued that the intertwining of space and time makes the story unique. Uh, in fact, it is so critical to the functioning of literature that Bakhtin suggests chronotopes could serve as a stand-in for genre itself. He gives the example of Greek romance, which exhibits what he calls adventure time. In this genre, two characters meet, fall in love, experience difficulties, and marry. But absolutely nothing leaves a mark between meeting and marrying. There is no great character growth, uh, characters don't even seem to age. Uh, their feelings, however, stay the same as though they are personifications instead of individuals. Uh, similarly, uh, space and time period are flattened out and non-specific. Um, this creates a peculiar effect. Divorced from those specifics of time or place, the Greek romance is governed by a logic of what Bakhtin calls random contingency. That is, things happen to characters without apparent cause just in order to drive the adventure. 
Chance governs events because there are no particularized customs, geographies, or histories that would motivate them. For example, war breaks out uh, simply to present an obstacle to the hero and heroine, not because there's a history of border disputes tied to something like local identity. Uh, and for an easy modern day example that we can maybe think about of differences in chronotope, um, we might compare the continuing hijinks of Garfield in the sort of unchanging 1979 present to the plot guiding life and material changes for the Patterson family across 30 years of maturation and for better or for worse. Uh, now, computer programs, whether narrative based or not, present their own space time relationships. Uh, an early side scrolling fighting game, for example, might provide an unending succession of a few simple background set pieces as the protagonist encounters a horde of generic and sort of inexplicably grouped bad guys uh, before finally rescuing the heroine and all on a single day with both characters unscathed by the extreme violence, right? Uh, all kind of similar to Bakhtin's uh, Adventure Time Chronotope in Greek romance. Uh, for many titles, however, the space-time relationship did not begin at the first screen. Uh, you may recall in that earlier Commodore commercial that the parents held notepads as they generated pie charts and worked out recipes. The pencil, not the screen, might be square one of the software experience. Moreover, users had to interact with disks, cartridges, and yes, even cassette tapes before a program began. As the ads conveniently neglect to mention, media was slow and occasionally unstable even then. If we consider that the user is a character in the stories that programs are trying to tell, we see that the chronotopes of early home computing were strongly connected with the physical world outside of the phosphor glow of the screen. Those exterior elements are a form of paratext. Now, traditionally, in the book trade, uh, a paratext refers to any number of elements about a document that were not part of the internal narrative. And so literary scholar Gerard Gannett offers a suggestive starting list of paratexts here. Uh, and while they arise from bibliography, uh, paratexts fit surprisingly well with computer programs. Uh, and I think uh, Gannett's sort of opening description is, is apropos. I love his idea here of paratext as a vestibule, a threshold, and an un, a sort of undefined zone between interior and out exterior. Um, and it certainly helps describe some of our experiences, including uh, one of our first conference purchases of Amazon by Trillion uh, Software. Now, for many users, uh, the first encounter with such a software title might have been in a print publication, like this issue of Family Computing from 1985. Uh, this presents the game in both a tips and hints section geared toward children, as well as a review section, uh, presumably for wider audiences. The hint hotline serves several functions. By granting access to secret knowledge, it promises to give existing owners a bit of a relief and perhaps even street credibility among friends. For others, the cryptic rhetoric builds intrigue and thus entices potential new customers. The review, meanwhile, offers a blend of description, evaluation, and game recommendation. It also hints nicely at some of the chronotopic qualities of the game narrative itself. Uh, the reviewer treats us to a screenshot, small here, but it, it, it's enough to exemplify um, what he or she calls several first-rate animated graphic sequences. But the text rules the interface, requiring the player to be, quote, phenomenally specific, and in the end, Patience is more than a virtue in this game, it's a necessity. So we will see why in a moment. So having been exposed to the game in popular literature and in advertisements, uh, the 1980s purchaser next encounters the box, which is, I think, beautifully designed uh, like a record cover. It's wrapped in authority from the sort of imprimatur of Michael Crichton on top to the corporate logo on bottom. Uh, the image between is notably not in-game graphics, but a mood-setting photoreal portrait, preparing the user's imagination for a world created mostly by text. So after seeing the parrot, you begin to associate it with the character Paco, who gives you hints throughout the game. Uh, the explorers in the jungle below, meanwhile, start suggesting a specific landscape. So with the state of early graphics, uh, these packaging paratexts, we might say, pre-fill the player's mental geography for the game's visual gaps. Opening up the box, the player is treated to a panoply of physical items which continue to set the stage. 
and upon closer invention uh, investigation, actually work alongside the software. The NSEP artwork contains the dossiers of government workers whose fate is described in a news article, which itself is inside an envelope labeled top secret. Thus, the backstory is set and the player is uh, sort of conscripted into an espionage plot by the game's physical documents. Now, some of these confidential documents are marketing pieces uh, and um, promotional pieces, my favorite being this pre-filled proof of purchase card from a 14-year-old in Ohio. Um, others are relatively important game details, including uh, on the right-hand side here, a likely ciphered strategic notes document. Um, but most important is a map that you absolutely must use to trace your progress, whether on paper or with a token of some kind, as I uh, chose to do here. Uh, someone perhaps could hack this and work out the route eventually with pen and paper alone, but I'm skeptical uh, because trial and error becomes at a very high cost. And so, having been prepared by advertisement, packaging, and special inserts, uh, you're finally ready to start, and it takes forever. Okay, so this video starts already far into the loading sequence, and even after it finishes, you're treated to an excruciating line-by-line -line text generator, which is supposed to mimic a computer terminal within your computer game. You're not even into the story, mind you. Uh, this is the title page, and only after some eventual slow line-by-line -line text removal, after it's all entered in, uh, only then uh, are you going to get something like a colophon, and then eventually the theme song, eventually. So yes, having heard your fill of what sounds like the bass line to the Peter Gunn theme, you are once again stuck loading. And finally, you think. An image, okay. It too loads excruciatingly line by line, um, and then, only then, are you treated to text and you can interact with the game, right? So after typing in uh, a first command, well, of course, you're then immediately fed into a video sequence of what happened to the poor field agents identified in your top secret letter. Um, but of course, this requires a loading period of its own. After the video finishes, guess what? You are sent back to the original computer scene after yet one more loading period. Even now, we're barely on the verge of gameplay. The player instead is treated to some banter with the boss and finally asked for a preferred difficulty level. By my count, I was somewhere into the seven or eight minute range before all preface material, uh, preface material was over and the settings were configured. Um, so this interaction between user, uh, software, and limitations of the media introduces a temporality that is foundational to the computing experience. I'm calling one aspect of this temporality the sunk cost loading fallacy. And now, you've probably encountered the sunk cost fallacy before, but in case you've forgotten it, um, the very aptly titled You Are Not So Smart website offers this quick summary. Basically, on something that's um, taking time, decision making becomes tainted by emotional investments in something, making it harder to abandon that thing, even if it would be wise to do so. And I'll avoid any sort of commentary upon graduate school at this point. Um, <laughs> If the sunk cost, uh, in the sunk cost loading fallacy, uh, the user is in fact goaded into deeper engagement with a piece of software just by dint of the fact that he or she has spent so much time waiting for it to load. After seven minutes, you're not going to flip the switch off lightly, but it goes deeper than that. The feeling of sunk cost accumulates in real time and is compounded by the fact that floppy disks are not the most reliable medium even in the 80s. I was shocked that Amazon loaded perfectly the first time I tried it, but the next day it threw an error. I tried again, I loaded directory listing on the back side, I tried another disk. Finally, I crossed my fingers, returned to side A and tried again. As it loaded this time, I waited expectantly as it passed what I thought was the first error milestone, waited some more, thinking is it stuck in an endless loop? Should I shut down and try again? Well, but I've already waited a minute and a half, maybe just a little bit more. Finally, that sort of little intro whistle sounded and the game was back in business. Um, even when everything works as expected, however, each load sequence builds upon a drama. 
as a review earlier mentioned, patience is a necessity because the game is unforgiving. The very first in narrative action you can perform after getting all the settings uh, is to leave for the airport, but I fail to realize that you need a letter in your inventory to obtain a ticket. You need to read it first. So each un uh, unaccepted attempt to board the plane ran the clock down, and sure enough, I missed my flight, fired from my job, sent packing to the sounds of the funeral march. Uh, that wouldn't be so bad, but then, guess what? The disk drive kicks in, the title screen eventually loads line by line and treats you to one more um, start screen loading, right? You know. Second time through, I got as far as setting the difficulty, then had the gumption to ask my boss for money to buy a plane ticket. Thrown out of the office, funeral march played, back loading to the start screen, and so on. If you figure an average of three to four minutes for each of these failed attempts, you can see this is taking all day. You know. But as frustrating as it is, the game seems to work precisely because of the sunk cost loading fallacy. Between each death, you might examine the physical uh, items you've unpacked in order to you know, pass the time, uh, immersing yourself in that paratextual imagery again. Then, once everything's loaded, you tensely navigate each step, holding, hoping beyond hope that you won't be sent back to an earlier state. Uh, even though there is a save option, it too comes with a cost. You have to swap back and forth between disks, again, none of which happens in an instant, and so one only saves strategically in the end. Um, the loading itself performed a paratextual function. Uh, when you get to the dialogue that asks to insert side B of the program disk, it's much like coming to the end of a chapter or installment, or perhaps even better, the intermission of an old movie. You feel a sense of achievement, take a deep breath, check an item off your list, and it was logical narrative design as well. The break happens right after the player successfully boards a plane from South America, and so the loading time coincides perfectly with in-flight narrative time, um, the delayed uh, sort of timing of the disk drive actually reinforcing a sense of geographic distance, right? Um, so that tension of sunk cost loading, that sense of place intimated by the art, and that feeling of recruitment by top secret documents, um, that sort of thing uh, could be lost by emulation alone, which is part of our infamous uh, impetus for uh, uh, collecting and accessioning our items as, as we are choosing to do. And uh, we found that other items we purchased enacted these uh, same chronotopic qualities in their own way. Yeah, okay, so oil barons, which uh, actually uh, inspired one of our colleagues to do a sort of a parody graphic for us, uh, creates codependencies between board game and sort of computer game qualities, okay? So the rules require that parents use game pieces to keep track of who owns which grid points on the map for developing oil wells. Um, get a close-up view here. Auctions required a reference to the board to see if any of the pieces up for sale conflicted with already um, uh, owned pieces. So the peer would select random grid points and you'd have to check to see if that would be allowable. Um, uh, so you might think, okay, this could be done all by board game style. However, the game also incorporated elaborate calculations, uh, especially the randomized uh, probabilities of oil appearing on certain kinds of land type, and, and this all would require computation. Gameplay, in other words, was, was built strictly on both modalities, the board game and the computer game paradigms, um, all of which intertwined, uh, intertwined with the predictably slow disk access rate between each turn phase. Um, even uh, sort of action titles that you think might be pretty straightforward, like uh, Airborne Ranger, came with paratexts that were more or less important to the story world of the game. In this case, the sheer quantity of potential player actions called for a keyboard overlay, which turns the Commodore into a tactical command center. Now, taken to an extreme, one could make the case that each potential link in the hardware software documentation chain bears on the meaning of the program, uh, and the expression of its time-place relationships. Uh, and as Gerard Gannett says, we must at least remember that in principle, every uh, context serves as a paratext. Um, again, which is why we've tried to collect as much as possible, including uh, multiple period controllers, many of which have already broken and required attention. Um, uh, specialty sort of one-off pieces like uh, mappable um, foot pedal systems, uh, 
and uh, other devices that sort of are in the queue but we couldn't get our hands on would, would be stuff like a touchpad, a uh, keyboard overlay, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, certainly not every software title in the period offer, operated in exactly this way. There were cartridges, for example, but slow loading was the price one had to pay for larger programs that could also write data back out to disk. Um, and design, as uh, some of our investigations suggest, often reflected these media limitations, once again, structuring the player's time-place relationship with that story world. Even titles without an elaborate physical apparatus uh, engaged with the hardware limitations. Um, in fact, hackers who cracked the copyright mechanisms of software so that it could be freely copied inserted their own sort of algorithmic paratexts into the loading process. Um, so notice the features of an outrun uh, crack that I was able to raise on our machine here. Certain qualities start to emerge over time in these crack sequences, such as a group identifier, greetings to other crackers, a listing of pseudonyms of the individual uh, hacker crackers, and often a fairly elaborate audiovisual presentation. For a significant user base, I suspect, even um, so-called legitimate users, this sort of illicit paratext was also a common sight. In fact, the artistic pull of such creations was so strong that dedicated enthusiasts developed um, crack intro sequences into an art form of their own right, which in fact continues to this day. In the so-called demo scene, programmers expressed their prowess by creating artistic sequences that overcome perceived technical limitations of the platform. Uh, so the pair text, originally for another program, becomes the primary text of a coterie hobbyist community. Um, now, given the trouble involved in inquiring working systems, which we could talk about, and the level of expertise required for an absolute, uh, obsolete platform, this artistic afterlife of the Commodore has a haunting quality to it. Um, and th this sort of leads to the ultimate why of our work, which we're engaging. Um, we are scholars and appreciate the challenge of the research, uh, but we're also fundamentally librarians. Preserving the cultural work is essential uh, to future research. Um, some might say, again, that this is taking it too far. After all, we don't preserve things like medieval scriptoria for illuminated manuscripts or private closets for 18th century novels, for example. But original computer systems uh, are not just an environment for reading. They're an integral part of the reading apparatus. While emulation does serve its purposes, um, much like the translation of a book from one language into another, the original edition still expresses meanings that are difficult to render in the remediation. I like the, the earlier phrase um, of swapping out translation for, was it um, trans, transcoding uh, from the earlier session? Um, I, I, I like it because it's, it's a step more than simple translation, I think. Um, and we do, after all, still preserve an accession illuminated manuscripts, 18th century print, even something like Babylonian cylinders, despite having created perfectly good digital surrogates. And we find that people use these originals. In fact, since starting this project, we have met uh, with at least one professor who is studying a particular software series, uh, Ultima, and he talks have begun to bring in a class to experiment with the thing itself, um, including all these feelies and physical items. Uh, this is much like requests I've seen from English professors to show classes, maybe Kelm's Cot Press, beautiful editions by William Morris, or World War I diaries, or any other manuscript or print special collections. And so this to me is all on a continuum of what being a laboratory of the humanities is all about in the uh, library world. So with that, I will pass on to, uh, the uh, mic to Matt and let him do his investigation here. Okay, so today I wanted to spend a little time talking about one aspect of chronotopes in the early days of computer gaming, and particularly one where the interface between the user and the computer code was a little more direct than some of the others discussed today. In particular, I want to focus on code books that require the user to build the program themselves, the so-called type-in code books. As part of this, I'm going to give a brief overview of these sorts of type-in programs, how they functioned as part of the time and space of early home computing, 
And then I'll go on a bit of an experiential account of one of these games, focusing on both how it functioned computationally to involve the user in the game uh, and its creation, and also provide some qualitative views of entering it into our Commodore 64, debugging and running it. So what do I mean here by type-in programs? Uh, well, these were printed versions of computer code that were sold as parts of magazines or books that the user could enter into their computer and then run. They were most often in the basic computer language, uh, though some torturous ones were printed in machine language with a base of loader. Um, and they were popular for hobbyists during the sort of late 70s and early 80s, before storage media like discs and tapes became commercially viable for software distribution, uh, and a little bit afterwards for educational purposes as well. Probably the most famous distributor and source of these type-in programs was Compute Magazine, um, sort of seen here on the uh, bottom left, um, but uh, which printed probably thousands of these things throughout the early 80s, um, though Compute's Gazette and Run were more directly focused on the Commodore market. Most of these programs, either from magazines or books, were designed to be cross-platform, uh, usually resorting to notes at the end of the program for lines that might be different on the Atari, VIC-20, TRS-80, or Commodore 64. So obviously not all of these were, were games, um, including the one seen here for um, heating and cooling auditing of a house, um, but in most cases the most popular and complicated came in the form of, of, of video games. So for this paper I wanted to focus uh, on type-in games, and particularly those that tied the narrative um, of the book itself or of the source itself to the physical object. Uh, and there were, throughout this time period, hundreds of type-in books published, and most of them took the form of a collection of a few to a hundred different small games. And here's pictured one of the, the earliest and most famous of these, uh, David All's Basic Computer Games, which also has the honor of being the first computer book to sell a million copies. So typically, uh, as you can see here with the literature quiz, which I thought was a little fitting, um, you often had a uh, brief description of the game, um, frequently an illustration, some sort of fanciful computer doing something, um, and then the code itself, maybe with a couple of annotations uh, to explain what was going on. A couple of other examples were things like adventure games, focused a little bit more on something in particular, uh, and the wonderfully named Itty Bitty Bites of Space uh, for the Commodore 64, um, where it was a, a more designed for a children's market of, of where you would have your children learn to program by typing these things in. So uh, these were the, the form of most of them. Um, however, a few publishers were a little more ambitious in the paratext surrounding the actual game, putting out extensive text, maps, character bios, or pictorial representations of important locations. And many of these pieces were actually key to the context and the chronotope of the game. That's to say that the experience of playing it as intended required both the book to create the code um, and the code itself to fully immerse oneself in the experience intended by the designers. Clearly this was, in a very important way, a time-bound phenomenon, uh, as it provided a method for developers to enhance the narrative of text-based adventure games or provide the context and the story for the, shall we say, vague graphics of most action-oriented Commodore games. And this was the, the way that these longer text functions could be a little bit variable. Um, in some cases, the, the code was actually part of the story, um, as seen here for survival on Planet X with the Commodore 64. The user would type in commands and the computer's response was meant to simulate something within the story. Um, these were often ex explicitly educational, designed to teach the user uh, the specifics of base, the basic programming language in a fun way. Still others used the computer code as a way to put the user into the action of something happening in the text. Um, the style often had a set linear narrative with call out places where the user should enter and play the game to experience the action. Um, so you can see here for this one called Time Lost, we have a comic uh, and then periodically throughout it, it has uh, notifications down in the bottom corner there to play the game here. So you can go off and type in all the code um, and then play the game. So this was... Um, this had the, the, the advantage of, of being able to um, explain what's going on in the Battle of Stone Age game down here, where you, you might be uh, excused for thinking it is uh, two ants uh, and four pies um, instead of Battle of Stone Age, uh, but also to give you something that actually brought you into the story in a little bit more detail. So Time Lost here serves as an excellent example of one of these types, um, as well as a documentation of, of 80s style and comics, um, as well as uh, a perfect example of uh, unfortunate images taken out of context. So um, compared to the, the, the sort of more basic, um, and yes, pun absolutely intended, type in books, um, there are a few relatively, uh, there are relatively few examples of a third type of richly annotated games. Those for which both the code and the physical object were necessary to play the game and work together to tell the complete story. So it wasn't just a call out sort of thing, it was actually both of them were necessary for the story. However, there are a few excellent examples of these that are easily accessible from Usborn Press, which was an educational publisher, um, still is an educational publisher, um, that put out several of these sorts of books throughout the 80s and who graciously made them available as high quality PDFs. 
Um, seen here are two of their main text adventure games on the right, um, and then four others that are, that are focused on using tools to design your own games or, or smaller collections of games. So for this project, uh, after examining and, and working with a few shorter basic games, I decided to focus in on just one of these newsborn press books, uh, Mystery of the Silver Mountain. Um, got it here, up here if anyone wants to see the original copy. Um, since I think these two games demonstrate a few interesting things about this form of program, uh, in that they require both the paratext and some aspect of the chronotope to really yield the, the, the experience that was intended. So just to go through the sections of the book so I don't have to pass it around, um, you sort of start off with a little bit of what is a type in book, what is an adventure game, so something where you're just using text to explain um, uh, locations and move around. Um, to the history of the world um, that it as in, in its current state um, with the evil invaders um, and then a certain number of, of dead heroes that came before you. To a map um, that has absolutely no relevance to the actual locations in the game uh, spatially, uh, but at least tells you some of where, where they are and sort of in a very, very vague sense of, of where they're located. Um, to uh, a little bit more narrative about the characters that you will meet, um, in this case sort of unfortunate stereotypes um, of Mongol invaders. Um, to evil critters that you might run into, um, up to the, the kindly hermit that may help you out if you get things in the right order. And then we get into a series of sort of places uh, that, you, that you might go that are going to explain something that's just going to be in text on the screen in a, in a little bit more detail um, by showing you a picture of it. And then we get into the actual type in part, where you're supposed to go through and sit down and type in every single line here. Um, in this case, it's 489 lines of basic um, with various changes that are supposed to be made. Um, they're very uh, nice about giving you some, some um, indications of, of where you, you might want to pay attention, um, particularly if things are in, in a different form or need to be put in differently in different languages. So different changes that you might need to make for your Commodore, for your, for your VIC-20, for your Apple II. Now, in a, and then very, very close at the end, the, the physical copy actually has a little thing that the digital one doesn't that says, if you want this on tape, send us 10 pounds and we'll send it back to you, um, which, again, I was a little tempted to do um, at some points. So in a perfect world, I probably would have done a few more of these games rather than just one, uh, but finding the working Commodore components, uh, getting an actual uh, type in book like this from the 80s uh, was surprisingly difficult, um, as was uh, finding a working disk drive uh, and still functional five and a quarter disks to be able to actually save drafts so I didn't have to do it all in one sitting. Um, so I was only able to get through one of these. Now obviously, um, as you might be able to imagine, um, I was pretty tempted throughout this process to take some shortcuts. Um, including using emulation and exporting code typed on a modern computer to the Commodore via um, uh, a nice little doohickey we have that converts an SD card to something the Commodore will read. Or this was suggested by uh, probably every single person that walked into our center while I was doing this, just getting one of our student workers to do it for me. Uh, <laughs> but I persevered um, because I felt to really understand the chronotope of these sorts of games, it's kind of necessary to actually do it. Um, this, this was a little bit of a masochistic urge, of course. So I had hand entered all 490, 89 lines, um, hit the last return statement, um, immediately went to run it, took about eight hours total. Um, and as I'm sure everyone can imagine, as soon as I finished, finished entering the last line, uh, I typed run, everything went off without a hitch. Um, I was immediately transported into the rich world of Mystery of the Silver Mountain and able to experience the textual experience that was, was um, intended by the developers. Right? No, I was, I was hit with a... Uh, with a syntax error almost immediately upon doing anything. Uh, as soon as I chose to load a new game, I got a syntax error and I had to go fix whatever that problem was. Um, so the, the, the problem with the very first one, of course, um, if anyone's particularly familiar with BASIC, uh, it's actually calling a data line. Um, it's a syntax error on a data line, which is something that was sort of an error in BASIC 2. Um, it's not actually the data line that's causing the problem, it's the thing reading it in. Um, it's an errant comma that I put in there um, that is calling an integer as, as, um, as a string, um, so it crashes the program and gives you no real trace of where that might be. So um, that took a little while uh, to figure out. Uh, the next time I loaded it up, um, I was able to get into uh, at least halfway through the intro text uh, starting a new game before my next syntax error. Um, the one after that uh, got me just a little bit further. I was able to tell it I wanted to go to the east before it crashed on me. 
then we kept going even a little bit more. Um, I was able to go a little further in. Then I got my in syntax error in 664, line 664. Um, if anybody noticed the program from when I had it up there, there is no line 664. At some point, it accidentally hit enter when the computer had told me there were 664 blocks free in my memory. So I had to go delete that line and go back in. And finally, I was able to get to the point where I could move around. Everything seemed to be functional. Um, I could, could move around um, and go into different sections. I died a couple of times, which was uh, fantastically exciting. Uh, and then I got into a room where I wanted to try to pick something up, um, and it was immediately told that that was impossible. Um, so this one threw no error, no error whatsoever. But in my sort of opaque thing where the, the commands are, I had managed to mistype both git and take. Um, so I couldn't actually pick anything up, which renders the game completely unplayable. Figured that one out, went back through, um, was immediately, uh, went to pick something up, um, to take something, and was, was hit with another syntax error. Um, this kept going when I tried to wear things. Um, this kept going when I tried to examine things. Uh, and occasionally it kept going without actually crashing anything, but just um, clearly I had forgotten to put something in that line since I don't think he took my uh, IT uh, dollar sign colon F64 uh, is equal to one. Um, but eventually I was able to get to um, some places where some things wouldn't still work. But finally I got to the point where I, 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 I could do some things but nothing else. Um, including the point where I was not able to drop anything, uh, where every time I tried to drop something in the game, it told me that I couldn't eat that, um, which was particularly fun when it kept telling me I couldn't eat the boat. Um, and as it turned out, uh, this one I had actually just skipped a line, so it was sending me straight through the um, uh, the, the eat or the drop subroutine into the into the drops or into, through the drop subroutine into the eat subroutine. So fun, great! Uh, I finally got all of these figured out. Um, debugging took a while. Um, finally got everything that it was working, with one exception, um, and it was just proved too hilarious to actually fix. It just made me laugh every single time it happened. So the game is supposed to be able to be saved. Every time you, you, you want to, you can save it to your disk drive or to your tape, your tape drive. Um, in my version, I have some error in it someplace that I never bothered to fix, because every single time you load a previous game, you're presented with, you are a half duck grave and you can go nowhere, uh, which just felt so fitting to me that I didn't bother to fix it, um, especially uh, one last little little poke to me uh, as, as I, I did this the first time as I also got a syntax where I tried to climb out of the grave. So um, it just felt it felt right um, to have it be this way. So debugging took a few hours um, before the game was even functional. Uh, but I think even the debugging process reveals something interesting about the chronotope of these games. Um, first, the experience is totally iterative. Um, the experience that I had, each run got me a little bit further into it, required a little more investigation into the code itself. Sometimes this was just looking at a single line and realizing that I left the N off of then. Um, other times it required diving pretty deeply into the code to trace a particular error. Regardless, it was an inher inherently an idiosyncratic part of the chronotope and would differ for each user depending on, on where the mistakes were made. Um, hopefully uh, most didn't make as many as me, uh, but that's, I don't know, possible. Um, but I want to turn a little to talk about the game itself, um, both the code uh, and the book. The game itself is a fairly standard text adventure with just a few tweaks based on the paratext, um, but I think those tweaks can be a little bit interest, interesting in sort of their, their uniqueness. So one thing I want to discuss uh, in a little detail is how being embedded in the creation of the game actually forces the user to experience things in some different ways. First, it gives the user a much more intimate view of the mechanics of the game. By entering code, you know at least the names of many of the key locations. Though to be fair, a lot of them are featured in the text as well, in the, in the printed book as well. Um, but there's more beyond simply knowing where the, the places are and what they're called. Um, you can actually embed, you, you can actually change um, just a few lines uh, to customize um, things uh, to, to, to be sort of as you would, you would like them. So the text you, you, you deal with here can be changed to address the player by name uh, just by simply finding that line, which is, is pretty obvious if you're looking at the code. Um, so you can change it to be your name uh, or really anything else you might want it to um, just to make things a little bit more uh, lighthearted as you try to save the world. Even further, it becomes fairly clear uh, in entering the game that the F array of variables controls, controls your inventory. There are many lines of code that check various things, and often it's clear from the response that gets spat back out that these things are, are, are from the code um, or from playing through the game, sort of what these things are. Um, though the developers, by putting it into an array like this, tried to keep it somewhat opaque. Uh, when playing the game, you can easily use all of your coins uh, or wear your boots of invisibility so long that they wear out. Um, just as a side, I've now unlocked a major nerd life goal by using the phrase boots of invisibility in an academic talk. Uh, but finding the lines of code that control for these things and changing them so that they last practically forever um, is, is very easy to do. It's trivial to find these things. 
But even a little further, as I alluded to with the opacity of the inventory system, it means the structure of the program itself is under some significant constraints. First, right off the bat, this, the second and third lines of code call subroutines towards the end. So it renders the program largely unrunnable until the code is done, which fits with the designers wanting to tell a complete story before the player placing the player into it. Second, because the game is entered by the players, the code has to find ways to avoid spoilers. And this is done in two ways. One, there are parts that rely just simply on randomness, um, either whether it's a path um, through being lost in a forest or a random number of coins needed to pass through certain points. And two, the, great, the game actually encrypts some text to keep the player from understanding it as they type it in. Now, if, you can, if anyone's immediately gone through this, this subroutine here, uh, this is possibly the, the, the most simple form of encryption possible. It's just the, the regular letter minus one, so a B becomes an A, a C becomes a B. Um, but at least it keeps someone from understanding it without a little bit of thought. Finally, unlike some other text games where the source code was available to the savvy player, the paratext of the Silver Mountain game actually reduced some of the constraints. While the primary function of the book was obviously to, to add immersion to the game, it actually allowed for things to be hidden in images that are not within the code, so you don't see them as you're typing in the game. For example, early in the game, you find yourself in a white cottage. Uh, the room described within the game only mentions the presence of a loaf of bread. It's up on the right here. You can see sort of the white cottage section here. Um, the game itself just says you see, you see a loaf of bread. Even if you, do ex if you tell it to examine the cottage, all you see is a loaf of bread. Um, by looking at the picture, what you end up seeing is that there's actually a chest, and a pot, and chairs, and all sorts of other stuff in there. And most of those things are, are available to be examined within the text of the game as well. And in fact, it is examining that pot that gives you the gold coins you need to actually pass through into the second section of the game. So if you weren't looking at the book, you weren't able to do anything with this. Now, yeah, this is a sort of rudimentary uh, copy protect, but it also gives you a little bit of, of, of a deeper um, indication of, of what the paratext gives to the game itself. And this is really, this is not the only example of this. Almost every one of the pictures has something in it that you need to look at and then interact with in the text itself. So just to conclude a little bit, um, these type-in books, and particularly these, these lushly illustrated Usborne Press volumes, uh, involve the user in the process of creating the game in ways that's not easily replicated in the modern game world. Um, it's just not possible these days. Uh, and in, in many ways, this becomes an inversion of how digital ephemera usually work. In the case of code for many of these books, the hobby hobbyist community has done an admirable job of preserving the actual, the actual program uh, to play the game. In fact, a, a simple Google search will probably find several repositories with emulated versions of every single one of the things that I've had up here. Um, but what's more difficult from an access stage is actually getting to some of the original books. Um, Usborne Press, like I said, has done a fantastic job of making these available as free PDF downloads because they're just not commercially viable products anymore. Um, but that's not, despite the fact that they're still in copyright, but that's not, that's not the case for many, many others of these from this time period. So what it means is the physical media is actually the more ephemeral part. The digital is easy to find, the physical is really, really hard to locate. Something that presents some challenges to librarians, archivists, and researchers especially in the case of these sorts of games where a true experience of the game requires both the paratext of the book uh, and, the, and the code to fully experience the chronotope and understand what the designers intended. Thank you. with a confession. I'm a gamer, and um, I'm obsessed with a game that was published almost four years ago. Now that's not quite old enough to be nostalgia cool, and it's still not quite recent enough to be cult of the new. But uh, the fact of the matter is I spend probably nine to 15 hours per week playing Grand Theft Auto. Um, now that's definitely not my most intense video game time sync, and I'm willing to wager there are many of you out there um, who could really be in that regard. To be perfectly honest, I play in large part because of the game's superb aesthetics. I meet with a circle of friends uh, many evenings of the week. We're all old friends. We've, been, we've known each other for more than two decades. Uh, one is in California. One is right here in Philadelphia. One lives in Houston, and I live in the heartland in uh, Indiana. So we can't get much further apart from that. We get together um, once a week for a book club that we have together, and we drive around the environment of the false California state of San Andreas, um, being antisocial and discussing all kinds.
interesting readings. But what makes it really interesting for me is the sense of space that it creates, the immersive feeling. So perhaps it's not unreasonable that I chose GTA as the starting point for my research on this presentation. How, I asked myself, could games more than 30 years ago hope to create similarly immersive experiences for their players, considering the limitations that they face in terms of hardware and software? To find out, I determined to take a closer look at a pair of games that have remained on my mind to some degree or another since my childhood, Little Computer People and Hollywood Hijinks. The first is something of a domesticated pet simulator, the second is a text-based game, and making each one pretty far removed from GTA in terms of content and gameplay. So I began sniffing out a hypothesis to test. Being at this conference looks at digital ephemera, I looked to the paratextual apparatuses of these games and found a neat little progression to explore. Each demonstrates a step in the evolution of the paratext's role in creating for the player a sense of space and time through his or her experience playing the game. So I had this idea that I was going to start with Zork, the great granddaddy of text-based games, and then sort of move into Hollywood hijinks, which is also text-based, and finally into the graphics of little computer people. And that would have made a really nice little progression to explore until I realized that little computer people actually predates Hollywood hijinks. Now, I'm sure most of you are thinking how ridiculous this was, um, this whole line of questioning, but it was my first pass, so I had to start somewhere. I mean, who says the Commodore 64 games were trying to even remotely achieve anything like GTA? How could I apply such a patently false teleology to the history of gaming? And I'm certain that some of you are asking yourselves, well, with a name like Lorenzo Valterza and a degree in Italian, why haven't you brought in the Renaissance to this? So, um, there we go, there's the Renaissance. So, for those of you who didn't brush up on the Renaissance before coming in here, many of you, I assume, um, this is uh, Giorgio Vasari. Vasari was a, was a 16th century Florentine who wrote what amounted to the first fully recognizable work of art history, The Lives, or Le Vite. And it contains uh, some 170 biographies of Italian, mostly Florentine, artists. But what makes it pertinent to this discussion is that Vasari's assumptions about the teleology of art's development can offer us all a cautionary tale, even to this day. So for him, Michelangelo had achieved a perfection in linear perspective and mimetic skill that all of his predecessors had striven for. That's in Vasari's mind. But they'd all, of course, fallen short of it. From, his, from Vasari's perspective, everyone was trying to get better than his or her master, and they led, ultimately, to this apex, Michelangelo. But this line of thinking as assumes too much. It's entirely too presentist in the wholly negative sense of that term. It judges the actions and goals of his predecessors on its, don on its own deeply anachronistic terms. Vasari assumes that the purpose of visual art is, at its very core, to strive for verisimilitude. And one wonders how harshly he might have judged um, Edvard Munch's The Scream. Clearly, Monka and Michelangelo, while both artists, offer us strikingly different examples of how historical expectations of any medium can and do change throughout history. But let's get back to computer games. Now, as a rule of thumb, I generally avoid asking what an author's intention was, um, but that's not to say that I ignore material history. Quite the contrary. In fact, when examining the paratexts, or the packaging and the feelies that accompanied these old Commodore 64 games, I came to understand them in a completely different way. In terms of literary theory, we might say that I had rediscovered the chronotopes that had characterized the gaming experience for the original intended players. So right now I should say that neither Hollywood hijinks nor Little Computer People actually pitched itself as a game at all. The paratexts of these insist otherwise. Hijinks presents itself in literary terms as an interactive story, and Little Computer People, well, it pitches itself as something more like a simulator of the experience of, of owning a sort of gimmick pet, not unlike those famous sea monkeys that you can buy in the back of magazines for a dollar. So one way we can think about what these programs are doing is by examining how they frame their player's role via their paratexts. In the interest of brevity, I'll limit myself to GTA V, Hollywood hijinks, and little computer people. So this is the back cover of a GTA V case that you might buy. And the description says, uh, Los Santos, a sprawling metropolis full of self-help gurus, starlets, and fading celebrities struggling to stay afloat in an era of economic uncertainty and cheap cable TV. 
Amidst the turmoil, three very different criminals risk everything in a series of daring and dangerous heists that could set them up for life. Note that your identity as a player is left unarticulated by the description. In fact, it's rather more cinematic it's rather than ludic. It describes a plot. It avoids the terms game and player altogether. However, the word game does appear five times right below, immediately below in the technical um, specifications. And this repetition taken together with the collective mass of references to the various gaming consoles and such um, leaves little doubt that you can best approach this product as a traditional game. Hollywood hijinks. So you contrast this with the packaging and contents of hijinks. Um, this is a text-based game in which you explore the grounds of your late aunt and uncle's mansion looking for artifacts that will allow you to claim your inheritance from them. Notice how the term game is also missing from this front cover. However, it presents itself as interactive fiction, and this literary pretense is fully reinforced by the back cover. <coughs> now, the back cover, though it has a lot more words, um, it likely askew, or likewise eschews the terms game and player, favoring this narrative quality. It says, get inside a story. Um, in fact, if you look at this portion here, it says, get inside a story. Get one from Infocom. It's like waking up inside a story. In fact, I won't read the whole thing to you, but it repeats story six times, okay, in the course before the end. And then in case you forgot that you're going to be getting inside of a story, it begins the last paragraph by saying, find out what it's like to get inside a story. Okay? So um, unlike GTA, Hollywood Hijinks takes extraordinary pains to establish an identity for you as a player. So it says, let's see. Your Uncle Buddy and Aunt Hildegard have passed away, but their memory lives on in their Malibu mansion, filled with a lifetime of Hollywood memorabilia. And you've inherited it all with one stipulation. You can only claim your booty if you find the treasures hidden throughout the sprawling beachfront estate. If you can't find the treasures in one night, you lose the whole caboodle. So it is, you are, it insists, the nephew of Buddy and Hildegard, two recently deceased power players in the world of Hollywood. That's your role. That in the box's text provides it to you and gives you your motivation for exploring their creepy mansion. And if this wasn't enough, the game includes a faux magazine that's part trade bulletin, part tabloid, and part sort of gossip and scandal rag. Um, so for example, there's something like 45 pages of stories like this that don't really have anything directly to do with the game itself. Okay, um, so it establishes through satire the sense that you, the nephew, are entering a special world of materialistic values and sort of fatuous entertainment. Um, but among the stories, you know, about, you know, ger gerbils terrorizing Gramps and such, um, it actually makes references to your aunt and uncle, so it creates a sense of a wider world in which you're entering. Okay, the next thing that it gives you, though, makes it more personal. So, uh, this is a will in the form of a handwritten note from Hildegard to you, and it starts out uh, with an, an affectionate, familiar terms. It says, well, pumpkin, I've finally gone to join Buddy in paradise. And then she challenges you and she gives you the whole point of what you have to do. Furthermore, your Uncle Buddy has also given you a picture of himself and a um, nice little glamour shot. And he gives you his own affectionate note on the back in which he gives you some tips. Now, this is actually quite useful for the game because it gives you clues on what to do. So, um, in any case, after opening the box, before loading up the game, you already have a sense of who you are, what you want, and what you have to do to get it. Now. Little computer people. Anyone play that? Yeah? <laughs> it's novel. I mean, it's fun. Okay, so it's a program whose pretense is that there are little people who live inside all of our computers, but who can be coaxed out into the open if the right conditions are met. So in buying the product, you're actually purchasing a house on a disk program. Um, the little computer people in your, in your computer will move into it and then largely go about living its life. It will occasionally attempt to interact with you, and you have to feed it. It's kind of like a like a Tamagotchi egg, okay? But Commodore 64's packaging is remarkable. So, like hijinks, it employs a faux publication that actually is the box itself to immerse you in its fictional reality. But this one avoids completely attempting to construct an explicit identity. Like hijink, um, hijinks, it actually avoids the terms games and player. Although it does say that your little 
a person will play a game. Um, no, but it creates a fictional pretense, and the idea is that all of our PCs are home to these little people. You just have to bring them out. Okay, but it takes the form of a scientific magazine. It's something for the next generation. It says at the bottom. And upon flipping to the back cover, you find a perplexing shift that takes place. The text and the aesthetics no longer pretend to be professional. Instead, the banner across the top announces in very serious terms that this is an advertisement. And with this change, the text becomes much more sensationalistic. It insists relentlessly on its own nonfiction by repeating the word actual six times on the one page, um, including that nice split infinitive in the title, but I'm being picky. So, you um, move on, and the, it cements this fiction through its feelies, and I'll show you the next one. It includes a large magazine with sort of graphics in it that emulates Time or Newsweek, giving you a sense, but it also gives you information on how to take care of your, how to interact with your little computer person. And then, last but not least, it actually gives you a deed of ownership. So again, the fiction that you're creating a piece of um, virtual real estate, and this little person's going to be living in it, okay? So little computer people spend, the paratextual spend nearly all of their energy assuring you that this is real, and it's kind of like a pet for you. Um, in fact, I found myself experiencing a strange sense of deja vu as I was reading the box and the instructions, and it suddenly dawned on me what it reminded me of. It was those old ads, I, I mentioned it before. Do you remember the sea monkeys, right, that you could buy in the back? It actually is, I believe, quite, and I don't think I'm the first person to notice this, though I've only found one person named Steam Powered Kleenex and who, put it, who mentioned it in a blog somewhere. Um, but, so this ad was published in 1978, and you can see that the box and the paratexts of little computer people echo or parody it in several key ways. First, the basic premise of each, you're purchasing the means of obtaining and keeping elusive little fantastic creatures. One is a program that looks like a person, the other one's actually brine shrimp, right? Um, you lure them both out of their hiding, one with a house, one with a magical potion that you mix together with growing food and water. Um, and the, this ad prefigures the content of little computer people by listing the activities that the sea monkeys will do. But we don't need to talk about this anymore. My point is, by parodying the sea monkey ad, little computer people quite intentionally emulates the relationship between owner and pet, not so much player and game. So, let me just wrap this up. What did I learn from this experience? Well, exploring hijinks and LCP was, um, as well as a dozen or so of the other games that we've managed to buy for our collection, um, impressed upon me how flexible and unfixed the category of games actually was in the early 80s. Hijinks could cast itself, for example, primarily as a literary experience because of its the literariness that made, wait, excuse, because its literariness made it familiar and relatable to its potential customers more than the label game. As Michael Newman describes this phenomenon neatly, when video games were new, people apprehended their novelty through associations with already familiar technologies and experiences. Just as automobiles were called horseless carriages, video games were familiarized by comparisons with existing objects, next to which they were often regarded as improvements." End quote. Indeed, this project has taught me that now that we're looking back at these programs that are rather old, we still apprehend them through associations with familiar technologies and experiences, except that now we're doing so in retrospect, fitting them neatly into the category of game as we understand it today. And I catch myself slipping up and referring to these two games as games. So I actually just did that unintentionally. But I think that's okay in everyday conversation. But I appreciate them not simply as a sort of primitive Grand Theft Auto or even The Sims, Instead, much as they did 35 years ago, the paratexts have helped this user, this player, understand these programs on their own terms and for what they were trying to do. And in doing so, I am confident that I can now grant them the dignity that my ignorance had denied to them when I started this project. Thanks.